Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed our pre-taped information from um, uh, both the information about the voice alarm study that Neil Vose conducted as part of the lobbying committee and also the bite-sized tasting training session that was on before. I do hope you managed to take the time to see that. Um, and welcome back to those of you who joined us in the AGM this morning. And welcome to those of you who are just joining us for the first time this afternoon. Um, I'm really happy to say we've got an excellent turnout. A little bit of an explanation um, about what's happening right now. Uh, we're going to have a talk, which I'll introduce shortly, but the session is being run um, in a mixture of live and pre-recorded format in case there are any glitches um, with the internet along the way. And um, what basically we can't see you. <laughs> You're all on a Zoom interface, which is a bit disappointing in, in some ways, because of course it would be lovely to see everybody. Um, but what we can do is to take questions through the text chat, they will be fed through to us um, so that once you've seen the presentation, if you wish to ask questions when we're live again, that's how you do it. And I'll be keeping an eye on the chat box all the way through to make sure that I share the questions accurately. So please allow me to introduce Liam. Good afternoon, Liam. Afternoon, Helen. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Been, been a crazy day so far, Liam. Now, for our membership, allow me to say a few words about you, Liam. It's often easier if somebody else does it for you, isn't it? It is indeed, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Liam Hayter is joining us today um, from a company called New Tech, uh, where Liam is a Senior Solutions Architect, which is an interesting choice of words because you'll, we'll, we'll be learning that he uses architect in, in the sense of a system architect as opposed to let's chuck some walls up kind of an architect, or at least I hope yeah. you do, Liam. Yep, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's good, that's it. And Liam's going to give us a talk today about um, AV over IP using a new protocol, which is uh, given the acronym NDI. And I'm not going to go any further. I'm going to let Liam explain all of that when he comes on to it. And I believe it's a proprietary protocol that we're going to find out about uh, that does some pretty powerful stuff. And one of the reasons that we wanted to um, invite Liam to give this talk today is mindful that now we are the IAC VE. And so what better way at our very first inaugural Members Day of our newly branded institute than to have a member of the AV community give us our first talk of the day. And of course, for all of us, it will be an interesting learning opportunity if audio is primarily our discipline to brush up our CPD a little bit and find out more about the AV sector. So that can only be to the good. Now, I asked Liam, how did he get into this? And what was really interesting to me was we've had this conversation many times between us all socially about how many of us fell into audio. We were all doing something slightly different. And I'm delighted to tell you that it would seem like our it, this may not be uncommon for our AV members also, because Liam tells me that he's primarily an artist who got into digital art and then for sort of like 20 five odd years has been working in video so without further ado Liam is there anything you'd like to say to the membership before we start your video no uh, I need uh, you know thank you very much for inviting us uh, for, for, for your, your sessions today and uh, thanks for having us on board so we look forward to your questions in the Q&A and uh, yeah far away with the questions at the end uh, there's uh, just ask whatever you like and we, we can help unpack some of that for you well, thank you, Liam. Welcome and over, here we go, membership. And I'm now gonna say something I've said several times today already, and I'm really excited about it. Roll VT. Hi everybody, thank you for joining me today for this webinar on simplified transitioning to AV over IP. My name is Liam Hayter and I'm the Senior Solutions Architect for NewTech in EMEA. 
To give you a little bit of background to who Newtech are and what NDI is, we are all form part of the VizRT group of companies. Uh, the VizRT group acquired us about two years ago now, and uh, we've actually separated out our technology, NDI, from the Newtech brand to give it a life of its own. VizRT are very well known for high-end real-time graphics and automation systems for broadcast, an area that Newtech also operates to some degree within, but also our focus mainly now is around the sort of pro AV and professional video production space. NDI started off at Newtech as our own proprietary AV over IP protocol and is now separated into, out into its own brand to give it a life of its own. Ultimately though, what everything that we do about and what new tech in particular has always been based on is about giving storytellers a voice through video and through innovation. We want to make it as easy and accessible as possible for anybody to be able to tell their story. You'll find new tech solutions in NDI used at everything from some of the largest events in the world such as football stadiums, multi-room music venues and the like, through to conferences, live events, racetracks and even small production studios like the space that I'm actually working in here now at home. Our technologies scale up effortlessly whatever size of project it is that you want to deliver. If we look at the sort of traditional video and audio markets we could crudely break these down into three areas. Broadcast technology, teleconferencing and communications and finally also traditional AV and audio visual technology for in-room type events. But the lines between these are starting to blur, the technologies that, dr you, that drive them are all starting to blur, and there's three main factors that are pushing this along. The first of these is that all of these types of technologies are becoming increasingly computer-based. With computers are going to come softwares and software-defined platforms to enable that, and then also increasingly they're all becoming linked together through networks. When we actually end up in this sort of ultimate merging of all these different areas, it's going to be about cherry picking the right technologies for the right application rather than this is an AV product and this is a broadcast product. And that's very much a trend that we're going to see continue right into the future. At NewTek, handily enough, we've always felt that the future of video production and live production especially is going to be built around these three main factors of computers, software and networks. And that's where NDI and IP really come into their own. Why are we all moving towards IP? Well, it's so that it all moves the same, uses the same type of fabric and the same type of cabling, which is Ethernet. In our case, it's going to be Cat5 or Cat6 Ethernet cables and above. This means you have one unified fabric for everything that you want to deliver, but ultimately also means that you can have ease of redeployment. If you want to change a room from a TV studio into a traditional meeting room, or if you want to turn a classroom into an event space, using AV over IP, this is completely possible because the fabric stays within the walls. We don't need to remove audio and video cabling necessarily anymore, but we just unplug and remove the devices themselves that occupy that space and can redeploy them on the network. Also, it means that devices on the network can be accessed from anywhere and used anywhere, which opens up all sorts of possibilities for collaborative production, uh, social distancing requirements, uh, overflow meeting rooms. The actual options and the creative opportunities here are almost limitless when we're working with IP. NDI is fantastic because it's one of the only AV protocols that really straddles all of these three silos and many, many more. We're seeing NDI now developed into gaming engines for the gaming market. We're seeing it in video wall display systems and the like. And it really is becoming a unifying common denominator to actually help drive this adoption and start bringing all these different silos together. But what does NDI stand for? Well, ultimately, it stands for Network Device Interface. It's, it is our originally our own proprietary protocol, but it, one thing that separates it out from other IP protocols is that we have made it royalty free and openly accessible through our software developer kit. At current, the only place that it's licensed is when you find an NDI embedded in hardware. So anybody developing software can take the SDK and build upon that with the work that we've done. It really has been built to work from the smallest to the largest networks. Every computer has got at least gigabit networking or Wi-Fi already on board the device. So why can't we utilize that? To drive adoption, we should take advantage of devices and platforms that people have already got. Commercial off-the-shelf hardware, commercial off-the-shelf network equipment. NDI has been designed to fully take advantage of all of those to enable AV over IP. 
NDI was launched in 2015, so we're currently coming up to the 6th anniversary this year and is currently on version 4.6. Some key headlines for what NDI enables is A, it is fully software defined. Even when we embed NDI in hardware, it's based on field, program field programmable gate arrays, as you'll see. NDI has been designed to be lightweight and low latency. We can't be zero latency because that's only really possible with uncompressed methodologies, but we do come very, very close. Our overall latency typically is around three frames. One frame to encode when we hit a device, a frame or so to take across a network, and one to decode at the other end. With using that low latency, lightweight compression, uh, we can actually enable many streams of high definition at 1080p60, up to six in fact, in each direction on a gigabit link, and we can enable up to three at present on 4K in and out over a single gigabit link. The actual compression we utilize is something called DCT and is the same type of compression that you'll find in modern post-production codecs. NDI uses human naming for ease of use, so from an operational standpoint, you don't need to be a network expert to use it and it very much becomes self-service as you'll see. NDI can also, as I mentioned, works in computers, but it can also work in cameras, converters, even mobile phones, and increasingly now you'll start seeing NDI peer in displays as well. We've made sure that NDI is fully interoperable with other standards, so we can gateway and bridge between SMPTE 2110 and NDI. We can bring SDI into NDI, and also make sure that NDI is forward and backward compatible. Majority of our systems also support Dante, so we can de-embed into Dante and actually bring Dante in-room sources into our work, into our network as well. And the key important thing is that NDI is fully future-proof in that it supports HD and 4K today. It can already support 16-bit color, and we can already even carry 8K if you wanted, with future tests already established for 16K. But it's not just about broadcast resolution, we can do non-broadcast aspect ratios, Vertical content for Instagram, square content for Facebook. We can take sources from tablets, phones, computers, anywhere in between and take full advantage of those sources because once it speaks NDI, it's usable. Some example vendors that are already working with NDI aside from NewTek and VizRC include NEC, Panasonic, Sony, Dataton Watchout, Disguise, BirdDog, Magiwell and Telestream and many, many more besides. In fact, the actual list now is over around a thousand different vendors generating lots and lots of different projects, products that can speak NDI. If you want to download our free tools, you can start using NDI straight away. Just visit www.ndi.tv forward slash tools and you'll be able to download a free suite of tools to start using NDI on your network immediately for both transmission and receiving. And we'll cover some of those very shortly. The NDI SDK, if you want deeper detail or start developing with NDI, is available at www.ndi.tv forward slash SDK, where you can also download further detail and white papers around using it on your network. But let's look at some of those free tools which are useful and some that I'm actually using here today. So my PowerPoint above my head in this virtual set is driven using NDI tool screen capture, which will take the drawer of a laptop display or computer display on both Mac and PC and generate that as NDI into the network. If I have a connected or embedded webcam or mic, we can bring those through and use those on the network as well. Another free tool is NDI tool studio monitor. Studio Monitor allows us to look at NDI on any computer on both Mac and PC and in the case of PC sources I can actually take control of them as well as you'll see shortly. And then finally we have NDI Tools Webcam Input. NDI Tools Webcam Input will allow me to take NDI back into a laptop and use it with any application that supports webcam and mic. So, so things like video conferencing tools such as Skype and Teams that have NDI native output, but also others like Discord, Zoom, Tencent, GoToMeeting and Cisco WebEx that don't natively support NDI tools. This means that anything that supports NDI can be outputted into a video conference which opens up all sorts of opportunities. But if you don't want to actually install software on your laptops, then of course we have hardware devices too. An example is our Spark IO Plus, which comes in three models supporting HDMI, SDI and 12G SDI, all the way up to 4K for the HDMI and 12G models. And this will effortlessly allow you to use existing cameras or plug computers and gaming consoles in and convert those to NDI. But those devices also go the other way. They can act as decoders and allow us to actually output NDI. So if you want to connect to existing displays or video walls or existing baseband fabric, you can. 
We also have server modules which have multiple SDI inputs and outputs as well so you can actually start distributing and removing video cabling and simplifying it down to gigabit ethernet. So there are currently three types of NDI in use in terms of actual physicality but there's two types of NDI when it comes to the actual protocol. The original and the main one that you'll encounter is full NDI or just NDI, which is what you'll find in our computer-based deployments and FPGA deployments like our Spark Plus IO mini converter here, which is this little guy in my hand. So that's where you'll find NDI embedded in FPGA. The other type of NDI that you'll encounter is something called NDIHX, which is short for NDI High Efficiency. And this is what you'll typically find in the majority of PTZ cameras on the market, but also in mobile phone applications like our NDIHX uh, camera for iOS, and also now available for Android as well. But despite the two different types of NDI, let's have a look at the actual specifics of the mechanics, and I'll also explain some of the data rate differences between those types. So first off, we're going to get an NDI network. In this case, I'm just going to use a circle to represent one single subnet. Now that subnet could be a wide area network, it could be a full stadium, it could be a studio or a meeting room. We can then populate that network with as many devices as we want. So in this case, I'm going to put an NDI input module, which is going to carry multiple NDI feeds from SDI. And at the other end, I'm going to put one of our TriCaster production systems to do the creative control over NDI. We can actually populate as many sources as we want on the network and by default those sources do not generate any major traffic at all. What we do do though is as the devices go around we can give them names. So a camera in Studio A would be Camera Studio A. Maybe a video will be Meeting Room Video Wall. We give them human naming rather than relying on IP addresses. Because what the devices do do is they actually use an MDNS broadcast which goes out on the network and that is a ping roughly every second within that subnet and we broadcast the name of the device in human naming, the IP address, the port numbers it uses, if it can be controlled or not, everything is contained within that one ping. At the other end, a receiving device is going to listen out for those pings and that generates a list of the available sources. When we connect to a source, then and only then, when the operator selects it by that friendly name, we automatically open up a unicast port on the network to carry video and audio to do between the devices. If you're using one of our TriCaster production systems, by default that is a 40 megabit per second preview stream that we use for our multi-viewers, joined by a full bandwidth 150 megabit per second program stream when we're working in HD. I'll show you some example bit rates in just a minute. But the nice thing with this is that you have your full program stream on a TriCaster that we can switch to dynamically and then we have the low bandwidth stream to maximize our data utilization at the other end. Now this ability to switch is unique to TriCaster production systems and will basically allow us to switch between them. But if you're using non NewTek devices you'll find that we just use the high bandwidth stream but you can enable the low bandwidth version if you wish to do so. Now one other nice aspect of NDI is not only can we carry video and audio in, but we can con pass control mechanisms back. So in the case of something like a PTZ camera, in this case it's one using NDI HX, this one's going to generate HD, but in the case of HX it's going to be 15 megabit per second. So NDI HX roughly represents a tenth of the bandwidth or a ninth of the bandwidth of full NDI devices. The data rates that I'm giving are target variable rates because of the encoding that we use, but these are kind of typically what you'd expect. But with NDI uh, and HX cameras particularly, or any controllable device over NDI, we can actually pass back control over the same connection, which means we can take advantage of operating that device from within our software or even from within the studio monitor application if we want to do so. Another means that we can take control is something called NDI KVM, which means that I can actually operate systems and our production systems and I.O. modules across the network too. So if I just pop open the studio monitor now actually directly onto my TriCaster here and actually bring that in for you to see, I can now show you a couple of examples of this auto discovery working in action. So first up, if I go into Studio Monitor here on my display, you can then see that I've now got a list here on the left of all the available sources on my network. I've got my Mac at the top, I've got my TriCaster Elite that I'm producing today's webinar in, I have my laptop where I'm bringing in the presentation and two cameras. 
So if I connect to this camera that's behind me, which is an NDI PTZ uh, HD over my shoulder, you can see that now that my camera is directly on screen within just a second. And using the on-screen controls here, I can actually take control of that camera. I can operate the camera position. I can operate the zoom within that camera as well. I can even recall presets from that camera as well if I want to do so, uh, all from within the GUI, within the UI. If I go down to a TriCaster, like my TriCaster Elite, I can actually look at the multi-viewer of that, and by enabling the KVM button on here, I can actually take control of the user interface. So this is another computer on my network that I'm currently taking operation of. If I take a mobile device like my mobile phone right now, what I can do is I can actually turn my mobile phone on, and I can go into here and I can turn on things like an NDI HX camera. And now within the same application, within a second of it being discovered on my network, I can now go down to my phone and then connect and bring that straight in. So now my phone is now a live source and you can actually see the sort of home setup that I'm currently working here within, within the space. So all pretty powerful, all pretty flexible stuff, but very, very easy to use, very low latency and using different devices to those that we would normally expect to actually use or operate. So that's the NDI KVM side and that will become more noticeable as we go along this webinar. But the nice thing with NDI is no matter what these sources are, it's all about sending what you need for the job. So as I say, if I go to a decoder or a screen, I'm only going to use the full bandwidth stream. If I go to a TriCaster, I'm going to switch dynamically between those transports and everything can be scaled up as I need. And the nice thing is all of this is handled within the same NDI protocol and multiple devices can connect to multiple receivers. Now the limit here is going to be the bandwidth I have on the device or the encoder itself. But if I was actually get to a point where I was going to exceed the bandwidth on a NIC or exceed the bandwidth on an available encoder, then I can simply actually enable multicast and therefore take the pressure onto the network and use the network itself to distribute. So we support both unicast and multicast within the NDI protocol, depending on the scale of deployment that you need. What makes us different to other protocols is we don't have to use multicast to enable that, layer, that level of scalability that you find with uncompressed protocols. To give you some example bandwidths of what we utilize, an HD signal at 1080p50 is going to be coming in at around 120, 130 megabit per second. And then the proxy stream is a 40 megabit per second, as you can hear on the chart. 4K is around 250 megabit per second and 40 megabit per second again for the proxy. If we're working with NDI HX, like a mobile phone or a camera, that's going to be around 16 megabit or 30 megabit for the equivalent standard in an HX. Now, these numbers are not, as I say, they're not exhaustive. Um, as we go to different frame rates or lower frame rates, the data rates will be lower. But these are kind of typical target values that you're going to be able to expect. But let's look a little bit more at NDI HX in more detail and how that's deployed. Uh, at the moment, you'll typically, as I say, find this within PTZ cameras, and we offer two models of PTZ. The NDI PTZ UHD, which is our 4K camera, and the NDI PTZ2, which is our high definition camera, all of which can be controlled, as I mentioned in the earlier demonstration. Through that control, we pass tally, pan, tilt, zoom, iris, focus, and shutter. All of that is carried through. So if I put that camera on air, I'm going to get a tally light on it. Same thing applies to our mini converters, and it's all handled automatically. And on the back, where, on the back channel on the connection, we get NDI video and audio. And one really nice thing is if you start using power over Ethernet, everything is now centralized on that one individual cable. So again, dramatically reducing the amount of cabling that's required to start doing these deployments and making it even easier than ever to move. From a mobile application standpoint, I just showed you the NDI HX camera, but another application that we have is one called NDI HX Capture. Now, NDI HX Capture is a very, very similar application. And this time it allows me to grab the screen of an iOS tablet or phone and bring that directly in as a source. So I'm just gonna start the broadcast very, very quickly on my device now, and I'm just gonna switch back to the Studio Monitor application and again, you can see my phone is still listed here, but this time it says display. So this is not a normal broadcast aspect ratio source. But what I can do is I can actually bring that up on screen and I could open up, say, today's news on screen. And I now have that as a live usable source from my phone. 
and if I cut back into our presentation here in the main production, you can see that that is now coming up as a live source behind me. So I can go into the news and if I'm presenting about what's happened today, say in the news, I can scroll through and bring that up as content or indeed any other application that I want from my mobile device, just as I would any other source within the system. Both these tools are incredibly powerful. The camera is available for Android and iOS, and we can take full advantage of optical zoom if you have it. The capture application is only currently available for iOS. If you buy one of our TriCaster production systems, there's a free version of the camera application included. Now, NDI tool screen capture that I mentioned earlier on, which is how I'm sharing my screen into this virtual environment, has another iteration which has recently been announced, which is NDI screen capture HX. This was developed in partnership with NVIDIA, so now you can actually encode directly off NVIDIA GPUs directly as NDI HX up to 4K, which opens up a whole new world of possibilities for deployment. And not only are we now encoding at CPU level, we can now also offer GPU level encoding with NVIDIA too. And this is another one of those free tools that you can download. Now this is great. We have all of these sources living out there on the network. We can bring all of these different disparate devices in on the same IP protocol and the same network fabric, which is great for just pointing things around. But what about if we want to start doing something more, do something more creative with NDI? What if we want to start building different rooms and spaces with NDI? It's not just gonna be about single sources either. Now, some example projects we've built are one like this example, where we're not only driving the meeting rooms or the TV studio, but we're driving the auditorium and multi-purpose rooms. We've done this at multiple sites now where they can all share and collaborate the sources between the different spaces. Now, the key to building this is our TriCaster product line. Now, the TriCaster you can see is sat here at the core, all the other devices that I've covered today, I mentioned around the top, around the outside of the ring. So our input sources on the left, output decoders on the right. And the heart of it, you have the TriCaster 2 Elite and two other systems. We have our FreePlay 3P1, Free which is a live sports replay system. And below that you have the NRS 16, which is our storage because we can record NDI to disk. And with our NRS storage, that can actually just pull in NDI in its own right and actually start caching those files as backup record and even edit while live. Now there are currently four models of TriCaster, which are our sort of creative core, our AV hub as it were, that we currently offer. We have the TriCaster Mini family, which comes in three iterations. The TriCaster Mini 4K that's in the picture here is an NDI only system, supports eight live inputs and outputs at 4K P60. We then have the 410 Plus with eight NDI inputs and a 1080p60 output resolution. TriCaster TC1 with 16 full NDI inputs and 4K P60 out. And then the one that I'm going to expand a bit more on today, which is perfect for the AV market, is the TriCaster 2 Elite, which has 32 live NDI inputs and dual 4K P60 out. The TriCaster product line effectively represents over 31 years of software-defined innovation at NewTek. The first video production system we built was the video toaster on the Commodore Amiga, because our founder found that you could actually generate NTSC video uh, on a Commodore Amiga. The TriCaster Studio was our first PC-based TriCaster that we launched in 2006, and then we launched the TriCaster 8000 line on in 2011. That then has evolved into the TriCaster 2 Elite that we launched last year to a massively welcome reception because of a number of special tricks that that system has up its sleeve compared to our other TriCasters and predecessors. The TriCaster 2 Elite is perfectly suited for centralized resources, so you can actually build multiple spaces around one system, i.e. like some of the education examples that I'll show you at the end. It's perfect for building auditoriums and larger scale deployments due to its rack mount nature. But also it has its number of different outputs, which I'll cover. So there are eight rendered full, uh, fully rendered outputs available as NDI and SDI simultaneously. And by rendered output, I mean something like this mix effect that I'm doing this webinar in right now. But also we have NDI output targets, which I'll explain. Around the back of the TriCaster Tooley, it's not all about IP and NDI. We also have traditional connectivity as well. So you have four multi-viewer displays, one for the GUI and three for additional multi-viewers, two of which can be 4K and two can be HD. We have eight SDI 3G inputs and eight SDI 3G outputs 
The outputs can be ganged when we're in when we're in 4K output to give us two 4K outs. Now, all of those connectors are simultaneously available as NDI. Even the inputs get converted to NDI. And then you have audio inputs and audio outputs, which we can utilize, redundant power. And finally, we have our network connectivity on the back of the box there. In the case of this one, it's one giggy RJ45 and one 10 giggy connection as well on the device. So pretty simple, but most of the power lies in the software and the NDI networking side too. From a source input standpoint, we've made it possible for you to connect to almost any source anywhere as part of a production or AV installation. The two Elite supports, like our other systems, SDI, NDI, HDMI through converters like the Spark Plus IO. We can ingest web streams like RTMP, RTSP and RTP directly into our systems. And now we've also added Secure Reliable Transport or SRT ingest and encoding if you wanted to connect systems across public internet. Where this really differs on the Elite though is we have integrated support for Teams, Zoom, Discord, Tencent and Slack. All of our TriCaster systems also support Skype and Teams via a platform called Skype TX and you'll have one or two input channels of that depending on the model that you're looking at. But all of these sources and more can be assigned to any of the 32 input slots on the TriCaster 2 Elite. Now, when it comes to utilizing those video conferencing, I think it's good to unpack that a bit more and what this means. Now, the main intention of what we do here is to try and break up the monotony of content that we're seeing in video conferencing. Everyone's seeing the same grid of faces day in, day out. And how can we look at making that more engaging? Well, of course, we can use the NDI webcam input and take different sources in just one to one. But what about bringing guests into a video production or into an AV installation? What about reaching guests that are completely remote and coming into an event via video conferencing? Well, we have the two technologies aboard here. So you have Skype TX, uh, which supports Skype and Teams one to one. And that's, uh, those are peer to peer connections that we can actually bring into the system. Now, with those peer to peer connections, what that means is one input, one caller, and we bring their audio in. We return an automatic mix minus. And we also have individual talkback and volume control to those guests coming in via Skype or Teams. The other technology we have is called Live Call Connect, which allows us to bring Teams, Zoom, Discord, Tencent, and now Slack callers directly in as individual inputs. And the way it does that is very clever indeed, which I'll explain. They get an automatic mix minus again, so they can't hear themselves, but the actual talkback is global. So because we can't actually demux audio, you get one audio mixer fader for audio input, and you have one talkback back to those applications as well. But what we do from a visual standpoint is we use image analysis built onto the TriCaster 2 Elite to separate out the nine callers, and at your maximum of nine callers, and present those as nine individual inputs that you can assign to any of the 32 input slots on the TriCaster 2 Elite. What that then means is if we go back to our user interface in our GUI, we can switch to them but we can also take control of them. We can do pan and scan. We can actually do some color correction and other tools on there as well, because every single input on every single TriCaster has the ability to do color correction, keying and cropping with no limitation whether you're working as HD or 4K across the whole system. And that applies to Skype TX and live caller inputs as well. So if, the, your, if your guests are actually against a green screen, you can bring in your remote guests into different spaces. We can bring them into the same virtual environment so it can look like they can have a conversation on screen. Now, that could be a very corporate branded example like the one I have on the right here. Or we can actually go a step further like we did on our video conference the other week. And I'll make sure everybody gets a link to this at the end for our education webinar, where my colleague Zoltan was based in Budapest and I'm here in London operating the system. And we linked our TriCasters together to actually do a joint presentation from one virtual set like I am here. We also then brought in other guests via Microsoft Teams onto the virtual screen behind us as part of that virtual set. And that's where things can start getting really creative because we start bringing more broadcast style tools and technology into your AV environment as well that allow you to actually create situations and environments you might not have been able to before. Now, this is great from a video standpoint, but what about routing and distributing NDI? 
Well, NDI is very focused on self-service. So as an operator, I can go in, as you saw, and choose from a pull-down list what source I want to see or control. The same thing applies on the TriCaster systems. If I go into any of the inputs on a TriCaster, I can pick and choose from that same input list what I want to see and control. But in terms of actually distributing and outputting content, you might want a more traditional routing experience. Now, routing capability is built into NDI. There are third-party routing systems out there which can also actually take control of existing baseband SDI routers you may have too. But on the TriCaster 2 Elite, it has an inbuilt output matrix which presents eight NDI connections out on the network that you can route any of the fully rendered mix outputs on the system to, along with any source or any media player or buffer or graphic, and actually send that out separately as a targeted output. Now, because NDI can subscribe to multiple devices at the same time, I could drive multiple video walls off just one of these NDI outputs. I can point sources to recording. I can drive SDI feeds back out to a machine room elsewhere, but just have two gigabit cables from the switch to where the SDI needs to be. I can use the things like the Spark Pluses again to drive onset displays or confidence monitors or use laptops in front of talent or a guest so they can actually see what's going on using the studio monitor. It's all targetable. What this opens up is some of the sort of projects that we've seen our systems be used for already. So courtrooms like the UK Supreme Court where we're using NDI cameras and systems to enable them to live stream all of the court cases in the, in the environment. We can drive meeting rooms and flexible meeting room spaces to enable any source to go up on screen or be used for video conferencing or be used to record a presentation or meeting. We can drive esports arenas like Gfinity that you can see in the example here. And Gfinity are driving multiple screens around on set and on location and every video wall you see in the example there is actually NDI. Same thing applies to House of Worship, where we're now seeing increasing the use of screens to display hymn lyrics or people who are actually on stage in front of the congregation. We're now seeing concert venues come online. Similar challenges, it's distributing video around the space as much as possible. If I'm in a theatre, I may have breakout rooms or the bar area where I want to show the content of what's happening in the venue. We can do that simply with NDI. We can drive auditoriums and teaching spaces for hundreds of guests at the same time. And we're also driving stadiums too, which is all being driven on that same protocol with the same technology, which means we can start bringing all of those different spaces together. But when you're using a TriCaster at the core, it does also mean that you can dramatically reduce the footprint of your AV installation, taking racks of traditional equipment into a single unit. Because the TriCaster is not just a video production system. It's also an AV router. It has your audio processing on board. It has inbuilt live streaming. It has inbuilt media players, it even has inbuilt recording all in that one box. And then the rest of it has all actually been abstracted by using the network and having encoders in the spaces where they're needed, which again, don't have to take up much room at all. Now for actually driving in room audio though, you're probably going to want to use something even lower latency again, which is where our support for protocols such as Dante and AES67 come into their own. And if you install the virtual sound card on the TriCaster 2 Elite, you can actually de-embed audio from NDI to Dante. You could bring your in-room Dante PA system in as a source to then bring into the video conference side or the live stream. So again, it's about reaching a balance and combine the technologies. And if you're working with new tech and NDI, we're not confining you just to our own platform as well. I'm now going to give you a quick example of an education lab and what that could look like, for example, using NDI and a TriCaster 2 Elite. We're going to have remote tutors and remote students at the moment. We'll have on-site tutors and uh, on-site equipment. We'll have on-site students and a classroom projector, but we can bring all of these together with this technology. A remote tutor could come in via Skype TX and would be using Microsoft Teams. A remote students or remote learners could connect via Zoom because that's a more easily accessible platform for them. We can have bring in NDI sources in the room, such as a PTZ camera for on-site tutors and sources via Spark Plus to connect in laptops and the like. We can also then output to student laptops and computers in the classroom, giving them a closer up view of perhaps what's happening in a lab or a workshop. And we can also output to the projectors and other overflow spaces using Spark Pluses. 
So this is one prime example of how we can start gelling all of these different elements to meet some of the remote challenges and distancing requirements that we're needing right now. But it doesn't just stop there, we can also integrate our control. So we can actually communicate with third parties and the like as well. So we can actually use built-in macro engine to generate automation. And whereas things like Dataton can receive NDI and display onto video walls, we can send macros from our systems and actually control the layout and trigger different stages. We can control QSC audio room processors. So if you were to set on QSC to drive your in-room PA, we can still send commands to that too. We can even control robotics such as Technopoint and other supported protocols if you want cameras that can move around a room on their own accord as well. So hopefully that's given you a good idea of what NDI can do, give you an idea of the sort of things that are possible. As I said, we're not, we're not about focusing on a particular silo here. We hope that it encompasses all different aspects of video content creation. Now, before we go into the Q&A, I just want to actually play for you a very, very quick example from our friends at the London Guildhall School of Speech and Drama, who have actually taken NDI to the next level. In the example you're about to see, NDI is being used, along with Dante, to enable musicians across multiple rooms and multiple spaces to play as one, with an orchestra and another space entirely. So I'm just going to leave on this short video, and then we'll come back to you for the Q&A, and I look forward to talking to you all shortly. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me enormous joy under the present circumstances to welcome you to the Guildhall School's Gold Medal 2020. The Gold Medal has been running since 1905, 115 years, year after year, continuously through two world wars. So we thought it was really important that Covid didn't get in our way this year. The medal is the most prestigious of the school's music events. Over the years, it's been won by really high profile international artists, including Jacqueline Dupre, Bryn Turfell and Tasmin Little. Tonight's performance is brought to you with a difference because it's going to rely on new technology of low latency networking. Low latency is a system whereby we can have musicians in different rooms playing synchronously with each other because of the reduction in delay between sound and vision. So tonight's symphony orchestra is split between three different rooms. Strings in one room, wind in another, brass and percussion in a third, the conductor in a fourth and the jury in a fifth.
Wow, I, I have to say, Liam, I've got absolute goosebumps after watching that. It, it's just been too long since we've been able to experience live music um, and uh, for having tried to face some challenges myself um, with music over the internet, I'm, I'm absolutely blown away. I find that really moving. Um, Liam, thank you so much for your, your talk. Um, on behalf of everybody here, really, really appreciate all the effort you've gone into putting that on. And, and honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm gobsmacked after that. Um, so I um, have to go and have some curated questions now. And I was watching them as they were coming through. And a lot of them <laughs> were talking about latency issues and the importance of, of latency. Um, and John, made the, John Oliver made a very good point um, about it being interesting um, and vital, really, for people who have got impairments um, yeah. in terms of hearing. Um, and then, um, <laughs> as Phil Brown put in the chat, well, I think that's a latency issue knocked on the head while that video was happening. Um, <laughs> so um, I... I just wanted to address that, but John, John is saying, no, it didn't address all of the latency issues. I see at the end of the performance, there was motion before the sound. So I think John's making the point that it wasn't absolutely perfect. Would you like to speak to us a little bit about latency, Liam? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, completely. I mean, that example at the end was using combination of Dante and NDI together. Um, obviously, we are live streaming, so things can drift a little bit with live streams. I'm sorry if that wasn't perfect. I mean, we can certainly point um, everybody to some reference studies that have been written up about this project, because that's actually how Guildhall are now producing a lot of their events and doing a whole stream of concerts uh, over the last God, last six six to seven months since they completed it. Um, but again, it, because we're not just saying you just have to use NDI, you know, our audio embedded is linear PCM. So if you bring it into a module into NDI, that will run in sync with the video. Um, and then you can partner that up with Dante because, hey, most musicians are using Dante. Why, why would we want to rock the boat? Um, and once we're in the TriCast, we do have the ability to adjust synchronization between audio and video on every single stream with a window of up to 2,000 milliseconds. So with some fine tuning, you know, within a single network environment, you know, we have tools that allow you to test how long something is going to take to get there and, and marry that up. Um, in terms of video encoding, the, the latency to encode, so to actually enter a network, if we hit the, we go through the lens of a camera and we hit the processor of the camera or we go into a converter or a piece of software, is actually less than one frame of video. So depending on your frame rate, it's about a 50th of a second to actually turn that into that source. And then it just goes across the network. We have to have another frame or two for adjustment. So timing, so everything falls into synchronicity and then one for processing, i.e. switching, color correction and the like. Um, so it's very, very fast. The actual feedback that we had from Guildhall and a few other broadcaster sites now as well is if you compare working within IP to other traditional SDI, say, formats, by the time you start adding devices up, the chain gets longer and every device adds a little bit of latency. With NDI, uh, just as you are with Dante, it's data. And once it's data, you use that data as such. So we don't need to re-encode and decode all the time. It's it's just noughts and ones. And, and then we can do some very clever stuff. So um, the, I mean, somebody said about 25 milliseconds or less would be good. Uh, yeah, if you're working at 50 frames a second, the window is 20 milliseconds, uh, really. And it can actually be faster than that. It's going to come down to your network. So um, yeah, the numbers are there. There are ways of tuning this and, and getting it very fast indeed. Wow. Um, yeah, obviously, we, we're painfully aware in audio about latency. Of course, you're adding another layer onto that. Um, and well, several layers from that example we've just seen. Um, I, I just think that was phenomenal. And I, I can personally forgive the little glitch at the end there. But I, I, to hear music like that being played from so many different rooms um, yeah. and, and the conductor being fed through um, onto people's iPads and things to keep everyone together. I mean, that that's a feat even when you're in the same room sometimes. So uh, that, that, yeah. that was amazing. It's just, it's just the PTZ cameras that was put in front of him um, and um, they, he just said it was just, you know, it just felt like it was no different. It was, you know, it was, it was pretty phenomenal. Oh. <laughs> 
Oh, wow. Um, there was a question which Colleen very kindly did put in the chat and it's kind of disappeared off our uh, window. Um, but I did take a I did take a note of it as the chat was going on during the talk. Oh, thank you, Colleen. I appreciate that. It's to do with can the protocol be used on third party product, um, yeah. such as we've got an example there, um, as in not, not, not new tech, but the protocol itself, can it be transported? Yeah, any anything that talks NDI talks NDI. So it's a key difference to point out that while it was started as a proprietary technology, we've given it its own life and it's openly, freely available for anybody working in software to deploy free of charge. Um, and that's oh, what wow. the SDK, if you want to get into the nuts and bolts on it, you know, we have competitors and, and other brands using NDI. So vMix, I think you're using today, uses NDI. Um, there's other platforms and systems from Panasonic, uh, NEC. Uh, there's other camera vendors. So Panasonic, uh, Bird Dog, Sony, Data Video. They all manufacture NDI cameras now where NDI is embedded in the product, um, even handheld cameras and the like. Um, I mean, I think there's over a thousand products that we know of in development. Um, I think the SDK has been downloaded 24,000 times, I think was the last count. Um, and so it's we, we maintain control of it. It's not open source. We maintain control of the library because it's about maintaining consistent experience for everyone. But anybody can really take that and implement that in software and it's uh, if, if you see a product that says ndi it will all work with every other ndi device it's forward and backward compatible as well um well that's um really great to hear that that's freely available for people to implement in their product um we're, we're big fans of, of, of having that available um and so that you can then choose the hardware that you want <laughs> Um, and you're not limited necessarily. That's fantastic. So there was another question related to that, which is in our chat window, Liam, which says, um, can you preview an NDI camera feed on an iPad if the camera and iPad are on the same network? Would that yes. be via YouTube app or something? Would VLC be usable? So if you were to use a PC-based tablet, you just install our free studio monitor, which is um, the NDI tools uh, link, and you can just download that. So you could run that on a Surface or something like that, anything Windows based. If you want to deploy on an iPad, um, there's a one of our third party developers is a company called Sienna. They've made an iPad app where you can look at NDI on an iPad. I don't know if he's implemented control on that yet. We'd have to have a look, but you know, a tablet type device, uh, if it's PC based is, is totally doable. You can certainly look at NDI on Mac and PC and you can control cameras from Mac. So Mac OS X, you know, iPad, uh, Mac minis, for example. Um, we, as a, I, I showed briefly the iOS camera app and the iOS capture, that's because we've recently now started implementing development for ARM processors. Um, you know, a lot of things are moving back towards ARM, which I'm really excited about. You know, I'm an old Acorn user back in the day, so you know, slight geek out. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll start seeing more and more implementations around ARM. There are third parties that have taken our SDK and put it into Raspberry Pi. So there's some homebrew efforts going on around this. So um, if you go to NDI.TV, there is a whole list of all the other third party vendors out there, people developing with it. Um, as I said, there, there's a whole there's a whole family of products out there that can meet most user requirements for, for these ones that we mentioned and more. Well, I mean, that, that tells our members where to go to find out that that's really great. So there was another question. I'm, I'm really happy, Liam, to say we have all these questions, you know, because it saves me uh, making stuff up. So it's just really, really helpful, isn't it? Um, what type of network switches are required? So basic level, I mean, I'm I'm running mine on my home network. I've just got a little thirty pound Netgear switch that I'm using to do everything in that webinar and my home Wi-Fi. So it's built around gigabit Ethernet and above, and that was a deliberate choice because every computer has it. Dante kind of already uses it. All modern buildings and majority of buildings have gigabit fabric already in them, or if you're building a new site, it's going to have it there. You know, Cat five, Cat six, ideally, if you're starting from scratch. Um, and um, you know the, the minimum requisite professionally, I'd say, is going to be a prof is, is going to be what you call a managed switch with a full speed backplane. So that would be in the region of one and a half thousand pounds and up if you're doing like a professional install. But you could use whatever you have available, really. Um, you know, even lower stuff if you're just trying to test it out and try around with what you have. Um, you can use anything beyond that. So if uh, I won't go on too much about this because I know we're a bit pushed for time, yeah. but. Gigabit cable can carry 
six feeds of 1080 video at 50 frames a second in each direction. So that's 10 cables on one gigabit cable. Uh, if we're talking 4K, I can have three feeds of 4K at 60 frames a second going in each direction on a gigabit cable. If you add move this to 10 gig network, you're going to get 60 and 30 because it basically you end up with 10 times the bandwidth. So we just grow it. And so the bigger your network, if you were having multiple switches like at Guildhall, they'll have switches in each location and then use a faster link, i.e. 10 gig or 40 gig to then act as like the sort of backbone of it really and it just scales up with that uh but it's been deliberately designed that you can start small and for those who want to try it the uh the tools link uh in that webinar and we'll, we'll make sure it gets out to everybody um you can have the send and the receive tool just grab two computers use it on your home wi-fi and uh you, you know you can you can start start having a look and seeing how it works and yeah you know, rather than me just sort of talking the sales where you could try it out for yourselves and uh you know, see, see what else yeah. you can come up with no, that, that, that's really good um one thing that you'd said that um, kind of struck me um, was kind of crossing over with the broadcast industry, aren't you? Yeah, well, that's where we, we funnily enough, we started in AV. Well, we started in broadcast in the 90s and then we were quite heavily involved in AV. You'll see our products in a lot of places where people want a streaming studio, um, you know, especially since we did the 8000 series because we introduced live streaming, dual encoding, which we still have. So it's been very popular in that. And then over time, we've kind of gone more and more into broadcast because broadcast is primarily uncompressed, but it's too heavy for most people. It's very expensive to run. And especially now in a, in a post pandemic world where we're working remotely, you can't work uncompressed. I mean, the data is 25 times the equivalent bandwidth for what we utilize. So people have started to come around to us, like, okay, well, it's, compression is actually good if it's fast enough. And, you know, talking about latency, is it quick enough, even though it's compressed? Um, and so we've then now, because we're software based and because of the types of projects that come online, it's the broadcast guys are using video conferencing. You know, we've been using Skype TX for a number of years, but now you're seeing Zoom used on the news. I mean, we never thought we'd see that because, um, you know, it's always about the best quality. And it's like you're using Zoom. It's, it's fine. So that's broken a barrier one way. And then the broadcasting guy, uh, so the AV industry really pushed the adoption of PTZ cameras. If it wasn't for the AV industry, pan tilt zoom cameras wouldn't have been the mass adoption and price point that they have. And then they've ended up being used in broadcast the other way. And it's, it's rapidly blurring and it, it's purely because we are network based and we have the right tools and the products and the third party in the ecosystem, i.e. display vendors now coming online with NDI. Uh, data to watch out to drive video walls and all this stuff. It really is propagating that notion of, well, it's all video and audio at the end of the day. You know, Dante's used in broadcast and AV. So if we combine them all together, we can make that one sort of user experience. And that space is, what do I want to do in it today? Not, is this equipped for audio? Is this equipped for video? It's like, well, no, it's an AV network. Let's make what we want, whether it's a stream like we're doing cool. today or a live event or a video call, anywhere in between, really. Well, it's interesting because, of course, Paul put in the chat at the, at the end of that question, you know, he's, he's being asked to fit more and more networks for AV broadcasts, and it's a minefield. And that's certainly been our experience in audio. You can get the network like horrendously wrong. Um, so I, what, what I took from what you just said, Liam, was really um, for scalability. It's one of those situations where size really does matter. Mm -hmm. It can do. Okay. I mean, it's, it's gonna. If you if you're starting from scratch, you know, you want to probably build around 10 gig networks and cat five just for future proofing, right. because things do evolve over time. Um, but yeah, as I said, we have ensured that you know it will work with what people already have. In most cases, there are going to be some where the network's so configured and, and saturated that it doesn't stand a chance. But you know, Guildhall was a, is a prime example where we put some dedicated fabric in. But a lot of it was running across their existing network as well. So we kind of took a, a dual tier approach. So um, it, it, it is it's going it, 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 it's to it's be the right tool for the right job. And we can always help with consulting and advising on any particular projects. We do have training available uh, for people to take advantage of. So um, yeah, there's plenty of resources there. But I, I will fall under the professional services team. I will get involved in the design of a project all the way through to delivery and installation. Uh, you know, we can recommend best practices because every use case is going to be slightly different. Um, but it's always going to be looking at what what is that? What's the aim? What do you want from the space? And then we can help. We can help assist you uh, with that. So. so, Liam, Tony said, um, Tony Stacey said, why is the tech not snapped up by TV right now? 
Oh, it is. It's, I mean, the, the TV industry, if we, if we look at the big broadcasters worldwide, a lot of them were heavily invested in a technology called SIPT 2110, which is the uncompressed protocol. And that was effectively being very crude, mapping standard SDI to a network cable. Um, and to do that, it does it 25 times the bandwidth. And there's been a certain amount of this fear of compression and the fear of latency and, and all the factors that we kind of discussed today already where broadcast is going, oh, it's not good enough. It's not expensive enough, you know, and, and actually a lot of them have come around to it. And it's again, tools for the job. So we've done work with the likes of BBC. Uh, we've done the works with major broadcasters uh, around the world, you know, uh, CNN in New York use NDI and some Vizarty and NewTek product. Uh, we have race courses doing 24 hour horse racing in Sweden using only NDI. Um, and as I said, it's the, it's the current world and the, you know, unfortunately everything we've had to go through the last year that's kind of driven the adoption and the acceptance of actually it is perfectly fine for what people need for the sort of thing that we're doing here. Um, and, and beyond that, because we retain all the color, we record all the resolution, but it's just a lot of people say, oh, you can't do that compressed. No, 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 no. It's like, you can. <laughs> it's worked in post-production for years. But it's, it's similar sort of thing. So, uh, <laughs> well, Liam, the... <laughs> uh, Liam, thank you so much. We, we, we've run over because it was important that, that we did address the questions that we'd asked for from the floor. I appreciate you answering so candidly. On behalf of everybody that has attended the session i'd like to thank you for your presentation today um it's not been uh you know not not it's not been an insignificant amount of work to put it all together and you'd have some practice runs and things with us so i really do appreciate all of the effort liam and um Absolutely. we look forward to welcoming you into the institute moving forward um and so on on that note um I, i'm going to do the silent clapping because that's more um, appropriate over this format. I'm sure we've had other members join in that because that's the kind of uh, people that we are. And I will then close this part of the meeting and say, I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone back. Liam, I do hope you will join us because no, at 3.45, we are having our second seminar of the day, uh, which is about Brexit and the impact of Brexit on our business with the two Andes. So I, I, I hope that you'll all join us back here at 3.45 as we to have the final presentation of our members day for 2021 and thank you once again liam thank you very much indeed thanks all you're welcome